Hi there, uh, this is Dave and uh, I'm going to take you through this new training course and it's called uh, Training Class 469 and it's the introduction to autoclave safety for controls engineers or actually for engineers in, in general. Typically this, this training is going to be taken by controls engineers but we might give it to a mechanical or electrical engineer um, as, as we see fit. Um, so let's get started. Uh, so the first step is safety is number one priority. We say it all the time and we mean it. Uh, the safety of our people and the products is the most important thing and should be the most important focus during your engineering duties, which is typically control engineering. Your focus should always be safety first and then everything else comes after. And so that is, just keep that in, in mind. We never want you to forget that um, because what you do and what you don't do could have very negative repercussions, could, could injure people and in some cases kill people if you don't know what you're doing and, and take proper and adequate precautions as you go. So, so this, this training will, will discuss the safety procedures, protocols, configurations and, and customer interactions involved in the goal of delivering a safe econoclave to our customer. So. Next lesson, no excuses. Uh, there's really never a valid excuse for not being safe and not addressing unsafe conditions immediately. So um, I, we really don't want to hear excuses why, why you would ever do something un, unsafely. Uh, to that point, don't, let, don't ever let anyone order you or convince you to do unsafe things, design something un, unsafely or allow equipment to be used or left in an unsafe condition. This applies to not only your peers, but also your managers and to customers. And, and what you'll find is, is inevitably, as you work here, um, you know, one year, two year, three year, you're, you are going to be put in unique situations where either a customer or a manager tries to convince you to, to do things slightly unsafely. And, and it's going to be your job to say no and, and to tell them why it's unsafe and to and to basically um, try to find a safe way to accomplish what they're trying to get you to do, okay? Um, that's an important thing. You are the leader of that, okay? Even though your manager might be above you and your customer, you know, customer is always right type of thing, it's not the case when you're talking about safety. You are the leader of that. Um, additionally, don't allow rushing to be an excuse to you know, cut corners when it comes to safety. Uh, again, we're always rushing or we, we always feel a rush, you know, we're always under a tight uh, deadline, but in the case of safety, we don't really care um, if it's late, if, if we're doing things safely. And, and, and the motto is, it's always better to be late than to be safe, okay? Or it's always, always better to be late than to be unsafe. So, um, the next lesson is take ownership. Um, what that means is, if you're assigned to design or to test an autoclave, you will be the owner of that equipment and will be held responsible for the safety of that equipment. What does that mean? Um, well, it means a number of things. So if you see something that, that's not right in what you're doing, then make it right. Don't allow legacy designs or old scripting or old configurations to remain if they don't adhere to our current safety standards. So it's going to be your job to, to recognize that and to put in place corrective actions. So if you see evidence that the safeties on a piece of equipment are not tested or weren't tested properly, then that is your obligation to report that to your manager and to the safety manager as, as well and, to, and then to make sure that they get tested properly. Okay, so even if it wasn't you who, who, who you know, incorrectly tested it, the fact that you see that it was not tested correctly makes it your ownership then and you have to follow through with the fix, okay? Um, even if a fellow engineer was the owner before you, you must always ensure that the equipment meets our standards. And what that means is, is that if, if you come in at the end of a testing phase and you're going to be the one to, to, uh, um, to finish testing, uh, it, it's your obligation to make sure that, that the first engineer did things safely and correctly. And, and what you do, if you, have, if you have good solid evidence via, let's say, an IN11, that the safety interlocks were tested properly, then you don't have to test again. Um, however, it, it will still be your obligation to analyze the wiring, the PLC code, and the CPC programming um, and scripting to make sure that those meet our current standards. Okay, so just because there's an IN11, it, when you walk up to a piece of equipment, the first thing you have to do is check those three safety 
um, obligations, okay? Because bottom line is, is you're about to, you, when you take over testing, you're, you're now the new owner and you have to make sure that things are safe before you start, okay? Um, pay special attention to, to hot areas on autoclaves and sharp edges and pinch points and areas that might easily injure an operator. Um, address those with your manager or, or with the customer directly if you're in the field, okay? So it isn't just, I'm, I'm just a controls engineer looking at, at the software. You want to actually be involved in the, in the mechanical side of that auto, autoclave and identify things that are unsafe and, and might injure people, okay? Um, as we know from training, in some cases, hot areas will be acceptable if they're out of reach of, the, of a normal operator and, and really unlikely to be touched by the operator, okay? But if it's right there where the operator can, can easily touch it, we're going to have to take corrective action to mitigate that, okay? Um, control upgrades. You're going to be upgrading a lot of old equipment. It, it might be old ASC equipment or it might be equipment from our, our, our you know, competitors. Um, the, the motto is, if, when we touch it, we own it. And again, that, that goes with, with upgrades. During upgrade jobs, ASC often adds hardware, software, or new PLCs to old equipment. During these projects, the fact that we touch the, the equipment means that we own much of the future liability of that system. If someone were to be injured, for instance, I mean, for example, due to a safety problem with the equipment, ASC could easily be, be found at fault due to our upgrade work, regardless of whether we actually installed or modified the failed component or system. And that's, a, that's an important thing, is if we're going in and working on one part of the equipment and the other part of the equipment has a safety issue and fails, then we can, e we can easily be found at fault because we're the experts and we should have known that and we should have addressed it. And so what it means is that even if the unsafe component wiring or programming was not ours to begin with, the fact that we're there and we see it, we should act like it is our responsibility and insist that it be corrected and brought to a safe standard. Now obviously, if it involves a lot of work, we can, we can get a change order for it, but, but it's our obligation at that point, okay? We own that equipment at that point in terms of, of making sure that it's safe, okay? Um, up, upgrades, software and PLC configurations. So, so, you know, for your control engineers, when, when upgrading older CPC systems or autoclaves, make sure you identify and report to your manager any discrepancies of the old scripting or logic when, when, as it compares to our new current standards. Um, so you're, you're going to be required to make it a priority to look through that, whether it's wiring or it's scripting or it's PLC logic, to confirm that the general safety logic meets our current standards, okay? And even if it's not part of your defined scope of work, even if you're there doing something else like adding some vacuum valves to an existing autoclave, you are obligated to look through those safety elements and make sure that, that they are up to, up to snuff, okay? And if they're not up to snuff, come up with a corrective action with your manager on, on how we're going to make that, that change, okay? Um, and what, what we'll do at that point is decide whether, whether that existing safety logic and ex, um, existing safety interlocks um, are safe enough to, to meet the, the, the future of that equipment, okay? Um, do not get complacent and don't say things like, I left what was there because it was working or I didn't think you wanted me to check that or the customer was, uh, was perfectly fine with it, operating that way, so I left it. Um, these all represent the wrong attitude and the wrong answer, okay? When in doubt, test it. Um, if it's not clear that the safety wiring or the logic or the scripting is working effectively or correctly at an upgrade job, then you are obligated to, to test it and to make sure. Just because it was working before doesn't mean that it's working now. And certainly there are many cases of ASC taking a piece of equipment down, upgrading it, and things don't work. And so safeties are the most important thing to, to check there. So, so um, unsafe mechanical electrical systems upgrades. Control engineers, if you notice unsafe mechanical systems on the autoclaves, then it's your obligation to report that as well to the customer and your manager. And what that means is not just don't just look at, at, at PLC logic and you know CPC scripting and wiring. You want to look at the entire autoclave and confirm that things make sense to our current you know standards, even if it's an old autoclave. 
because most of the customers don't really know what the new standards are and it's useful to use that as an opportunity to both educate them but also maybe get more work okay so so um, what are the things that that you want to look for you know lack of hardwired safety circuits is a good one lack of proper door door bar locks there are some autoclaves out there with very poor door lock inter interfaces and it makes them dangerous uh, pieces of equipment um, a lack of a low pressure switch to indicate that that the, that the pressure in the autoclave is is at zero before turning on the hydraulics for example lack of person in autoclave cabling systems um, you know what we call the safety cable system uh, broken limit switches uh, on, on you know certain safety components, lack of incorrect high limit controllers, uh, lack of oxygen sensor and perch systems on larger autoclaves is also a big one because a lot of older autoclaves that were large don't have those those very standard safety systems. Okay, and lack of an e-stop button and circuitry, which you'll find on many autoclaves, and it, it's just worth bringing up to the customer and your manager and deciding how we're going to deal with that because what we don't want to do is is upgrade a piece of equipment and then have these have that equipment fail and injure or kill someone because of hardware uh, of lack of of hardware that that was that could have easily been added and, and corrected okay fight for safety uh, so not all companies are are as interested in safety as ASC that's a that's a sad fact but it's true for this reason you will regularly be in the position to fight for safety and spend time and energy educating customers and sometimes can try to convince them to implement proper safety systems on their autoclaves although you will always be on the right side of the argument you should use tact in discussing this with with customers okay so what are they what are the key points educate them on safety systems and interlocks Take the take that extra time to really talk about what the what the safety what our standard safety systems are and why they're important. When you spot unsafe things on customers' equipment, explain what the issue is and why it is unsafe. Don't just say you need that and walk off. You have to explain what it's used for and try to get them to to understand the, the gravity of it. Explain that the new standards are put in place to avoid injury and death, and that is it 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 because of that it is a very very important thing. Okay, a lot of customers who've been running autoclaves their entire lives don't really understand how important safety systems are, and and they'll and ultimately they end up finding out when when you know something catastrophic occurs. So um, you can explain that while it might be costly to improve safety systems, it is a tiny fraction of the cost of an injury or death or a lawsuit that that will occur in the, in that case, and the fact that you would be injuring someone um, that. You know, one of your one of your actual coworkers. So, perspective is everything, and it's your job to talk to customers about that. Um, if the if the customer still resists, and and they probably will in certain cases, you you can also, as a last measure, talk about the fact that today there are many court cases recently where where courts have have issued harsh punishment and jail time to managers and owners. Um, who have disregarded safety and have allowed employees to, to work in, a, in an unsafe environment and then a worker gets injured. So no, no longer can a lower level manager just say, well, I was just following policy because they will be dragged into court and they will be, they will be put in jail as well. So these are all reasons why, you, why we should, why, why the customers should um, make these changes. So, um, so what, what mechanical safeties? Uh, well, ASC Econoclaves utilize a number of mechanical safeties that, that, that you obviously know about up to this point. I'm just going to run through them very quickly. The bar lock is almost one of the most important things, and that is the mechanical bar that interfa interferes with the rotation of the ring. And this bar typically rotates into position, is locked into place with an air cylinder, okay, driven by autoclave pressures. So when the bar moves in, autoclave pressure pushes that pin up and locks that bar and keeps that from being able to be opened. Uh, we also have integral limit switches on those on those bars. Now what you'll find is on older autoclaves they might not have, have limit switches properly uh, addressed or the bar might not have a, a pin to lock it under autoclave pressure. So, so there are, there are diff different versions of that out there. Um, pressure relief valve, it's a spring-loaded valve that's basically set by the factory to a certified pressure equivalent to the ASME design pressure for the vessel. Now, on an ASC autoclave, the working pressure of the autoclave that we set is always 15 PSI below the maximum operating pressure of the pressure vessel, okay? So, 
the relief valve is generally going to be set 15 psi over our maximum operating pressure. This, this valve is designed to open and relieve at that pressure setting. Um, and basically every pressure vessel on earth has got to have a safety relief valve. It's mandatory. Um, safety cable on large autoclaves, this is a cable, uh, it's often called man and side alarm and that's, that's no longer used because there are women in, in autoclaves too, but um, this cable is provided inside the autoclave to allow a tra trapped operator to stop the autoclave operation and, uh, and return zero pressure and uh, ambient, ambient temperatures, okay? So that's a, that's a safety system that uh, if, if someone gets into trouble, they're gonna pull that thing and, and big alarms go off and everything happens like that. So uh, oxygen monitoring systems, these, these have been more and more a standard uh, thing in the last 10 years on, on autoclaves and large autoclaves. Uh, this, this is provided for any autoclave where an operator regularly walks into or gets into an autoclave in either a standing or crouching mode um, and basically it's designed to monitor the interior working volume and identify whether a safe or unsafe condition for oxygen is um, existing uh, and 19.5 percent is the OSHA level for for a safe oxygen environment okay so above 19.5 everything's good below 19.5 it, it's considered un, unsafe and as you get lower and lower it it will go from being being um, you know confused and woozy to being dead at about 6% oxygen. So 19.5 so, so, uh, is that OSHA safe level. Um, and that's interfaced with the, with the control system and the purge system. And the purge system is basically a, a, a pressure blower and, and a valve which is used to direct fresh air into the um, autoclave after a pressurization cycle. The purge blower will continue to flow air in until we get the 19.5%. So, so most of, most large autoclaves, or really all large autoclaves, should have an oxygen monitoring system and a purge system if they are pressurized with nitrogen. Okay. Electrical and software safety interlocks. So, so the rest of the training will, class will it will talk about three sets of interlocks that we're going to go through: hardwired interlocks, PLC interlocks, and CPC interlocks. So. Um, AC typically uses these, uh, these interlocks to provide safe operation of our autoclaves and ovens. Um, hardwired interlocks, what is that? This is when electrical signals are, are wired in series with relay contacts that disallow unsafe operations. These wired interlocks can use standard relays or safety rated components that might be required by local codes or ordinances. So in, in most of the European applications, they're going to require safety rated components, whereas in the U.S. we, we are still allowing um, in general safety to, to use standard relays for that. Um, PLC interlocks are basically PLC logic, um, so PLC programming logic that interrupts the you know, CPC operational signal and, and provides a level of sort of interlock on those signals to make sure that they don't, those don't get all the way over to the device that we're trying to control. Um, and then there's the CPC interlocks, which is basically internal configuration and scripting that provides the safety interlocks on, on the outputs from CPC. So, so th those are the different levels, and, and, and the most critical would be the hardwired interlock because that's the, that's the last in the line. And then we have PLC interlocks and then CPC interlocks. So, so um, Let's talk about hardwiring pilot policy. So it is AAC's policy to hardwire certain critical safeties for the autoclave. These include operations that might result in personal injury. So basically, we don't hardwire every type of interlock on, on the control system. We only focus on those things that might result in personal injury, and that's an important distinction. So uh, the first is the emergency stop button. That is where an operator tries to hit a button and he wants everything to stop. So that's going to disable heaters, motors, valves, and it'll also vent the autoclave, okay? Now, interestingly, if you happen to be at an elevated temperature and you hit the e-stop, it's gonna shut off all the pumps, all the cooling pumps too, so it will remain at that elevated temperature because the e-stop condition is not gonna allow pumps to operate because that's a powered device. Um, high limit temperature controller, that's a indivi individual independent um, controller which monitors a thermocouple and will provide a, a latching signal to the PLC and, and to the relays 
um, that will indicate an over temperature condition. So that's a requirement on all autoclaves. Um, over pressure switch, that's a pressure switch which basically is set about 5 psi over maximum operating pressure and that is going to, again, trigger a relay which, which interfaces and, and is fed into the PLC and to CPC. Um, that's going to disable the inlet valve and open it, the exhaust valve. And door lock limit switch, that's, a very, that's that bar lock, but door bar lock. Interlocks inlet valve and opens exhaust valve, also interlocks hydraulic power unit to avoid door opening when it's locked. And the low pressure switch, another important one, is basically a very low pressure switch that operates at about a half a PSI and it's, it, it basically is interlocked with the hydraulic power unit to make sure that we cannot open the door if there's pressure in the autoclave. So that is a very important one. Without that, we would likely be opening doors under pressure, which is not good. And lastly, the safety cable system, which is basically the, the person in the autoclave cable used on larger econoclaves and deactivates the OK to pressurize signal, thus dumping pressure and disabling heat. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, let's, let's look at, at some examples of OK to pressure, of, of um, hardwired interlocks. So you're going to find a, a certain relay in, in all of our, our control systems called the OK to pressurize relay. And this, this relay coil right here is typically um, tied to a number of permissive contacts. And when I say permissive, permissive means, means that those contacts have to be enabled or provide power to permit that relay to energize. And that relay is then used throughout the system to do specific in hardwired interlocks. So the OK to pressurize relay is energized when the emergency stop button is OK, the door is locked, the safety cable is OK, and the overpressure switch is indicating a safe condition. The OK to pressurize relay contact forces the exhaust valve to open, and it's also tied to the auto enable circuit. So right here, there's an auto enable circuit which comes through the high limit controller, through the normally open contact of that high limit controller, which means that it's safe, through the OK to pressurize relay, and then over to the auto enable relay. So, and we'll talk about the auto enable relay later. Now what you'll see here is the OK to pressurize is, is is not only set up on the inlet valve, but it's but it's also on the pressure exhaust valve. And, and right here, you see that that if the if we're okay to pressurize, we have normal control of our exhaust. But if we're not okay to pressurize, not being normally closed, we actually feed a forced 20 milliamp into that exhaust valve to 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 make it wide open. And that 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 that's done by by running 24 volts across a known resistor, which provides a specific milliamp, 20 milliamps to that unit. Okay, now this specific image is not, is not including the, the, the safety cable, and that's because this was taken from a smaller autoclave that, that didn't have a safety cable system, but with the larger systems, the safety cable would also be here. Okay, Hard, hard wiring, we also have the auto enable relay, and this is a dedicated relay that is used to interlock the heating system and the inlet valve, okay? And this relay is energized when the autoclave is okay to pressurize, and the high limit controller is indicating a safe condition. And it's important to note that, that the inlet valve, rather than being tied just to the okay to pressurize signal, it's being tied to the auto enable signal because we don't want to pressurize when, when we have a high limit condition. And so, so as, as we saw in the previous slide, the, the high limit signal is hard hardwired in series with the okay to pressurize, and then that is then terminating over at the auto enable relay right here, okay? And so that, that relay is, is then tied to, to your, um, all your heating contactors to, to keep heating from, from occurring, and it is, it is there as a permissive for the pressure inlet signal coming from the four to 20 milliamp from the, from the PLC. And so the auto enable relay is, is basically the, the, the thing which is gonna stop addition of pressure and addition of heat, okay. And we talked about the high limit controller, um, and this is again a, a, a critical safety system. Uh, in, instead of having a high limit relay, we are, we're basically just taking the power through the actual relay within the controller as the permissive for the, for the auto enable um, uh, input, okay? And the high, high limit is typically going to be set about 50 degrees above maximum operating temperature, and that's because the, the high limit thermocouple is generally under the floor in the hottest region of the autoclave. 
and under the floor by the heater you're going to see about a 50 degree difference. The, um, the high limit relay is, is one of the interlocks used to energize the auto enable relay, which is what we saw before. So, or the yeah, the high the, the high limit controller is actually one of the interlocks used to energize the auto enable relay. Emergency stop. Uh, so here's the emergency stop circuit, and depending on the size of autoclave, there might be one emergency stop button or multiple. There can be up to ten of them in very large autoclaves. And they're all going to be wired in series and providing a single sort of um, huge stop of all all outputs on the on the autoclave and, and the way that that's done is um, is basically uh, that e-stop is tied into a contactor or a series of contactors and that contactor each contact is then is then routed over to for example here all the digital output modules so what it's doing is when that when we don't have an e-stop meaning everything's good we're, we're providing power to, to all of our output points. But when we interrupt that, that power by hitting e-stop, all those outputs shut off. So the only outputs that we remain on are the things that are on lights. Um, alarm lights, for example, we're not gonna e-stop an alarm light. And, um, and you know, indication things like, like uh, um, horns and, and that type of thing. But, but all other outputs, any valves or any motors, those are all going to be interlocked. Okay, and we also see that the no e stop is also in the OK to pressurize um, relay, which makes it part of the permissive for auto enable as well. The overpressure switch. So this is an independent pressure switch that is usually set five psi over the maximum operating pressure of the autoclave, um, which happens to also still be ten psi below the pressure vessel maximum. So everything's good there. This this is a normally closed you know switch going to a PLC input module and a relay called no overpressure. So the relay gets energized when there is no overpressure condition. So it's a maintained relay. In this case, the no overpressure relay is energized whenever the autoclave in this, is in a safe condition. The no over, overpressure relay ca contact is then hardwired in the, in the OK to pressurize um, relay. So what you what you see here is because no okay to pressurize is also a permissive for auto enable you you can see that that when we get a overpressure condition it will also shut off heating and the reason we want to do that is because adding additional heat will will pressurize the autoclave just by the expansion of the gas okay and a very important one is the door bar lock. This is a limit switch often titled door locked or bar lock monitors the door ring bar lock me mechanism. This switch that's shown right here is usually tied to a green light called, and usually one of the stack, stack lights or, or it could just be a door locked light and to a PLC input um, and, and to a relay called door locked, okay? And that relay then is used both in, in the OK to pressurize uh, um, uh, relay, which again is a permissive for auto enable, so we can say that the door needs to be locked for both pressure and for heating to occur. And it's also used to interlock the hydraulic operations of the autoclave so that, that the door is not locked when the hydraulics are, are, are to be run. So. Um, and then another very important one that we talked about is the low pressure pressure switch. This is a pressure switch used to indicate the autoclave is fully depressurized. It's not triggered at zero PSI, but it's triggered at about a half a PSI. In, in some very large autoclaves, we have, a, we have a much bigger pressure switch and that will actually actuate at a very, very low pressure, like, like 0 0.05 PSI. Um, the switch is wired to, a, to the panel light, a stack light, PLC input, and the relay called no, um, no pressure enclave. So there's our special relay, no pressure enclave. And again, that would then be used in the hydraulic circuit to, to keep the hydraulic from ever being able to operate unless we have pressure, uh, no pressure in the clave. Okay, so that, that again is a maintained, this relay is maintained when, the, when everything is safe, when the pressure switch is down, okay. So, um, and we have the safety cable. That's the hard wiring for the safety cable. This cable system utilizes one or two ca cables on the side of an autoclave and ro rotational switches that are on the outside of the clave tied to a rod. Um, and those are used to basically tie to a a full length safety cable down the down the length of the autoclave um, and that 
is then tied to lights, but also a relay called safety cable OK. So again, it's a maintained circuit in series, OK? When you pull it, it shuts this relay down. So it, but if everything's good, then the relay is, is energized, and that's why we have OK at the end of this description. And that relay is then used for the OK to pressurize as well, So, which, again, knocks out the OK to pressurize and the auto-enable relay. OK. Um, let's see here. Now, if, if the uh, a special consideration of the safety cable is if, this, if, the, if, you're, if you have a safety cable on, a, on an autoclave which has a hydraulic door, okay, um, normally we would, we would have a, um, an interlock with the hydraulics that would disallow it from operating when the oxygen monitoring system determines there's unsafe air in the autoclave. But um, there is a there's a, uh, a there's a caveat to that. If if someone's in the autoclave and they pull the safety cable and he's about to die because he's about to be asphyxiated, um, we will allow that door to open when there's no good air in there because we want to get that person out and save his life. And so there is a bypass right here that you'll see a hardwired bypass for safety cable OK that basically says, hey, if the safety cable is not OK, meaning someone has pulled the cable, then go ahead and allow this door to operate um, and bypass all of the O2 related, oxygen related um, uh, interlocks. And, and when that happens though, and again, you, you, you need to, to know this as a controls engineer and train on it, it's important to train operators and supervisors about this safety cable um, defeat of the interlock. And that's called defeating the interlock because there's an interlock for O2, but this defeats it. Let them know that in, in case a person is trapped, if the door is opened with, un, that, that one, the door will be allowed to be opened with unsafe O2, but that they shouldn't enter the autoclave to rescue the, per, rescue the person until they get safe oxygen or they have, let's say, a fire department shows up with a respirator. Because what we don't want is to have one person in the autoclave with bad air and then someone goes in and they, they faint or, or drop dead because of lack of oxygen. Um, what we do want to uh, urge is, is, is that when that door opens, keep the fan running and very quickly the oxygen in the autoclave will, will rise to 19.5%. And so it's just a much quicker way of purging the, the autoclave in this specific, very serious um, you know, condition. So, Okay, and lastly, uh, purge inlet valve. So the purge inlet valve um, is used to, to connect the autoclave to the purge fan for the purpose of filling the autoclave with breathable air. This valve should only operate when the autoclave is depressurized. So basically, it's a big valve tied to the, to the you know, purge fan. If that valve were to open inadvertently um, under autoclave pressure, for instance, it, it, the autoclave pressure will, will come out of that valve so quickly that it will completely blow up the, the, the purge blower and throw pieces of metal everywhere and that could actually kill people um, or definitely injure people around. This has actually happened a few times in the last 20 years on non-ASC autoclaves. Um, uh, they were not ASC control systems, but, but, but we heard about the aftermath and, and there were very close calls. No one was ever killed or injured, but it could have been very bad. Um, for this reason, we have added a special pressure switch that's, that's put in series with that valve a dedicated switch, and we call it a one PSI switch, but actually that pressure that gets set is, is unique to each purge system. So be, because the purge fan will actually pressurize the autoclave slightly when it operates, it's important that the pressure switch be set slightly higher than the maximum purge pressure uh, developed during that purge cycle. So um, to set this, what you do is you run a purge cycle and then slowly drop the pressure switch setting adjust it down, down, down until the valve closes and then adjust it up a little bit so that the valve opens and that, that'll be the, the correct setting. So you, you, you want to be just at just above the, the normal purge pressure which is going to be developed when that purge fan is, is you know, operating. So, um, so that is basically uh, all of the hardwired interlocks. Um, and uh, obviously, if you get custom autoclaves, there might be other type of hardwired uh, interlocks that might occur. Uh, but these are the, those were the basics. And 
Now we're going to be going in, into the PLC safety interlock policy, which is, so we have the hardwired and now we have the PLC programming. So the PLC logic is used, uh, the, the PLC logic is, is used for different purposes, including IO mapping and routing and motion control and safety interlocks. The following dictates the PLC safety interlocks that, that are, are going to be used. So door lock limit switch interlocks inlet, inlet valve and opens exhaust valve. Also interlocks hydraulic power unit to avoid door opening. Uh, we have the high limit temperature controller. This should be disabling heat. Over pressure switch. This should disable inlet valve and force the exhaust valve to open. Low pressure switch. This should interlock the hydraulic power unit to avoid door opening and the safety cable system, this should deactivate heating and pressurization, should also open the exhaust valve. So, so we're going to move forward and, and there is a bit of a discrepancy here. Uh, we have changed this, this policy a little bit, but before we allowed the control engineers to, to put corrective action in the PLC for conditions such as high limit or or safety cable pulled or this type of thing, but we decided to move all that into CPC and really keep the PLC only turning things off, not turning things on. So it is ASC safety, current safety policy now to have most of the control logic in CPC and not in the PLC. While it might seem prudent to have duplicate logic in the PLC, it can add confusion, control discrepancies, and make the equipment harder to diagnose and troubleshoot. So here's what it will not be in the PLC logic now. First is is the safety corrective actions. While it's required to interlock energy addition operations in the PLC, we don't want to take active on-off control or, or on control of devices during the safety event. So, so what that means is it's okay to, to block signals going out to valves and this type of thing, but we're not going to be turning things on like cooling pumps and, and cooling valves and that type of thing. The reason for this is that some corrective actions require complicated logic, and this logic is much easier and more consistently performed in CPC. It also avoids the problem of having different corrective actions in you know, CPC than in the PLC. So, so we don't have to try to be harmonized in terms of which, which one's taking control. We're going to say CPC is going to take control in these, in these cases. The only exception to this, there's one exception, and that is the PLC will open the exhaust valve. And that, that is a, a very simple um, action, and, and we've, we've determined that the PLC can do that. So, and that is the only corrective action that we're going to allow both to do. Okay. Um, the other step is don't cool the autoclave on high temperature limit or safety cable condition. So no cooling, no active cooling from the PLC perspective allow CPC to handle all of that, the actuation of the cooling, because, you know, basically, you know, CPC is going to going to handle trim cooling properly. And when you're at an elevated temperature and you have multiple trim coils and all this other stuff, it, it gets very complicated if you have to do that in your in your PLC logic as well as in CPC. So the only thing PLC is going to do in the case of temperature is interlock heating, and that's it. Um, and then we're not going to turn the fan on and do any any type of safety corrective action when it comes to a you know, like a safety cable being being pulled. That's not going to occur in the in the PLC. That's only going to occur in in the CPC scripting. Okay, and so um, th those are the things that we're not going to see in the PLC anymore. Um, if you have questions about all this logic, there is a new document, 76031, and that is going to have all of the standards that we're going to follow. And so I've, I've made sure that this training matches what's in that document. So, so what do we have here? Let's, let's start with uh, door interlocks. So normally there's a hydraulic enable um, output of the PLC, and that is going to uh, be, be fed from the PLC logic. And uh, as, as you see here, we have no e-stop, O2 safe to enter, no pressure in clave, um, door lock limit switch is, is not in the lock position, the door bar is unlocked and it's not locked, and then we can operate the hydraulics based on our push buttons. And what, what, what you'll see here, which is a little different, is, is there's our bypass. And remember, I was saying that, that I'm going to allow the hydraulic enable to occur, even with bad oxygen, if there's a safety cable event. And, and so this is what allows us to open the door when a person is in, in, in the autoclave. Okay. Now the other thing that, that we've that we changed in this logic is, is when we try to open, open the door, um, 
we're going to require that the bridge is up before the hydraulic pump kicks on. And when we try to close the door, we can't close the door um, if the if the safety cable is is uh, is not okay. And so so this right here, this this specific thing says, although we're we we are you know safe over here, and we might allow the safety cable to operate the hydraulic. We're not going to let it operate if the if the purpose is to close the door. We don't want to close the door on someone who has pulled the safety cable. And um, and then on the on the bridge operations, we, we want to make sure that the door is is open. So um, so that's that's the case. Uh, now you might. You might say, um, so here's here's an, another point that we already made, but although in most cases we want to restrict door opening, in the case that the safety cable is pulled, we are allowing the door to open with low oxygen in the autoclave so that we can we can rescue that, that trapped um, person. We, we really just, I mean, we can't wait 20 minutes for a purge cycle to complete, right? Because at that point, the guy's going to be dead. So, so um, this is, again, something that you want to train operators about and let them know um, about this specific operation that 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 a door can be opened in an unsafe condition in basically an unsafe oxygen condition when there's a safety cable um, incident okay pressurization interlocks again very similar there's a pressure allow which is which is like the the okay to pressurize relay of the hard hard wiring and that is basically looking at the door locked um, the ring locked now now here I'm because I want to make sure that not just the bar is in place I'm going to put in that the door be closed, that the door limit switch is closed, and the ring is locked, and the bar is in place um, to to get allowance of pressure. Um, I'm also going to have uh, no high limit because we don't want you know high high temperature condition. We don't want a overpressure condition, um, and we don't want e stop, and we want our safety cable okay. So all of these are tied into this pressure allow. Um, you will notice one thing that the PC failed bit is not in here. So normally we would have interlocks to say, hey, don't allow pressure if the PCs have failed. Well, there's a reason why PC failed is not in this specific coil here. Um, it's, it's not in there as, the, as a permissive for this one because it, it will be used independently in the logic which uses contacts from this. Um, and, and that's ma mainly be, because there's, we, we want to use this pressure allow in certain logic that, that does not use the, the PC failed signal. Okay. If we had a PC fail signal in here, we wouldn't be able to use pressure allow for other logic where we didn't want a PC fail to, to be um, there. So, so what, what you'll now see is, for example, for the inlet valve. So the, the in pressure allow coil, which is right here that we generate here, is used in series and in parallel with the PCs failed. So this says, um, this is where we're, we're moving the, the CPC analog you know, signal over to the valve. We allow that to happen if pressure is allowed and we are not having a PC fail condition, okay? If we do have a PC fail condition, we're going to move a 4 to that valve. So that, that's what shuts that valve down, okay? Um, and, uh, and, and so this is basically saying, hey, if, also if I don't have a uh, if, if I either don't have pressure allow or I have PC failed, I'm going to move the, the four over to the valve and shut it. Um, exhaust valve it works a little bit different. Uh, if I'm allowing pressure control, I'm going to move CPC's exhaust valve command to the valve. If I don't have pressure allow, then I'm moving a 20 to the exhaust valve, wide open. If I'm allowing pressure control, but my PCs have failed, I'm going to move a four, and here's here's another case where there are three conditions now. There's one that leaves it wide open, and then one that, and the reason I'm doing that is because I don't want to move the exhaust valve to to full open when the PCs fail, because that will that will end the run and destroy the parts. And normally we we want to put it in a in a closed condition, giving the operator enough time to reboot the computers and try to figure out what's what's wrong with the PCs. So. PLC heating interlocks, heat allow. So here's a lot like auto enable. This is heat allow, door locked, door closed, ring locked, no high limit, no overpressure, blower and fan at speed, um, and then uh, no e-stop and safety cable okay. And in this case, I can have and PCs haven't failed, and that's going to be in heat allow. 
and that guy is used as a uh, interlock or permissive for all of the heat contactors, okay? Um, we're also going to use that for a permissive for moving the SCR you know, signal from the, from the CPC register over to the analog output. Um, if it's not heat allow, then we're going to move a 4 there. So just blocking this alone does not change this AO. You actually have to have another rung here which forces the 4 to the AO, and 4 being 4 milliamps and 0%. And if we have SSRs on the autoclave, smaller autoclaves, then it, it would work this way, okay? You would have the heat allow in the, in the rung as a permissive to the PCDO, digital output. Oops. Um, so now we have PLC bridge interlocks. Uh, the drawbridge should include some safeties to ensure the bridge can't be lowered when the autoclave oxygen is depleted and the bridge cannot be raised when the safety cable is pulled. So you're going to see these two permissives are new. Kind of similar to the door operation, we, we allow the bridge to be lowered so here, we're allowing the bridge to be lowered if, if O2 is safe or if the safety cable is pulled, right? And so this allows us to get someone out of that autoclave quickly, even if the autoclave has unsafe oxygen. And, and we're not going to raise the bridge if someone has pulled the, pulled the safety cable. Obviously, that, that's locking them in the, in the autoclave, right? Um, so that's, uh, that basically is all of your PLC uh, interlocks and now we're moving on to, to the CPC interlocks and we're almost done with this training. Um, I'm going to run you through some of the scripting here. So although we have addressed the safety interlocks in both hardwiring and PLC logic, uh, this does not mean that we don't have to do the same in CPC. Okay, you know CPC scripting not only in, in includes the same interlocking as the PLC, but it will also include the corrective action control that we talked about um, in the PLC coding or not being in the PLC coding. So, so basically CPC is going to not only interlock, meaning turn things off, but it's also going to turn things on to correct um, uh, you know, safety conditions or over pressure, over temperature conditions. So um, I'm going to call this general safety logic. So CPC's main logic script is, um, is basically separated into different systems. These, these usually include pressurization, fan, heating, cooling, vacuum alarms, and other specific sections. And, and you know, sections are typically denoted by a, a equal sign, a, a line of equal sign saying pressure or temperature. Um, although most control and interlock scripting is placed within each of the sections, so the temperature lot interlocks will be in there, pressure interlocks, and, you know, and uh, other type of systems. The general safety interlocks should be placed at the top of the script in, the, it, in its own section. And so we're going to call that general safety logic, and you should put a big header like this, general safety logic. Um, and general safety logic refers to any safety condition that will affect more than one system. So what you'll see here is, is most of these conditions um, will not only affect the temperature but also pressure conditions of the autoclave. And so we're going to call those general because they're, they're going to be one safety condition which is affecting a lot of things, okay? And we're going to put that at the very top of the script. Um, and um, this, is, this is kind of what you'll see there. Um, now, the order of scripting and how you put scripts in is very important in CPC. And I've seen lots of cases where control engineers do it incorrectly, put, put things in the wrong order, and, and the result is that the interlock isn't even, isn't even working, okay? So, so the CPC scripting runs from top to top to bottom, so it's important to understand where to put specific safety and interlock scripting. Adding scripting in the wrong order will result in certain situations not being properly interlocked. So the uppermost general safety logic should include the safety interlocks that might affect more than one system, and it should be in the following order, okay? And it's very important that you put your general safety in this order and this order only, okay? And the reason is because some things that over, if you so the, the main reason is safety cable logic and e-stop logic um, will take active control of, of you know, corrective actions, and these up here will actually turn those off. So we, we want to make sure that, that, that the sort of that the hierarchy is these are the, are the lesser um, uh, general safety topics, and these are the more important ones. So the more important goes at the bottom. So we start with temperature interlocks. Now, um, the standard should be, there should be two, two temperature interlocks, okay? One that, that, is, that is looking at the air temperature being greater than five degrees over 
um, over uh, maximum, and in this case it would be 450 would be maximum, so 455. And then we, we want to look at, at the high limit, um, at the high limit controller, okay? And uh, and so the the high limit controller trips. So so what? Or, or sorry, there's 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 one where RTC is greater than five degrees a minute, or five degrees. There's another where RTC is greater than, than twenty degrees above maximum. And we're taking those two different steps here. One is when the air temperature just goes a little bit above. We're just going to turn. Um, air control and pressure control to to no more than 50 percent and what that does is, is that will stop heating and stop pressurization and hopefully that's just a little overshoot that's occurred and we don't want to take drastic action like drop contactors and do this other stuff so this is a sort of a preliminary limiter that I'm talking about here which is going to do um, limit those the the SCRs and the, and the heaters um, but it isn't going to take drastic action, okay? Drastic action, though, occurs when air temperature gets more than 20 degrees above or the high limit is, is engaged. And so we say if no high limit equals off or air TC greater than 470, then now I'm going to take action. Heat enable is off, is going to drop all the contactors. We're going to turn cooling on and we're going to set a, um, a set point to 70 and we're going to limit pressure, okay? Or basically restrict all inlet of, of pressure. This is going to actually force active cooling, maximum cooling in this case. And, and so um, that, is, that is going to keep uh, going un, until this, this specific condition is reset, okay? And, and so that's a, this is a newer um, feature here. That this one up, up here wasn't our standard prior to this, to this uh, training. It is now, okay? So there's, so five degrees above, 20 degrees above, two different conditions happening. Autoclave door interlocks. Okay, CPC's general safety interlocks include uh, the door bar lock. In, as an input, it might be called door lock or door bar lock. Um, in the case below, pressure enable and heat enable are turned off. Additionally, the main set point of the pressure controller is forced to zero. And so this is a pretty simple thing. And by basically setting pressure control main set point to zero, far down below this general safety interlock in the actual pressure logic controls, there will be a clause which, or a, a condition which, which basically says, if pressure control main set point equals zero, then force the output to be zero. And so you don't have to set the output to zero here because just by the fact that this is above the other logic, it will, it will generate the, 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 the um, correct logic condition in the pressure um, you know, section of the script, okay? Overpressure interlocks. Okay, CPC's general safety interlocks have two overpressure conditions. One is the over overpressure pressure switch, which is generally set to trigger about five PSI over maximum operating pressure. And the second is the, is the high, high pressure transducer reading. So, so um, or the pressure transducer reading, which, which might be high. So when either of these overpressure conditions occurs, we want CPC to disable pressure control and, we're, and, we'll, and request a zero set point. The latter step will force later scripting to force the exhaust valve open. We, ju we just talked about that in the, in the pressure section. So the script also sets the pressure control which is semi-auto. So this is a little bit different than, than the temperature one. So be because we consider overpressure to be a much more sort of important and dangerous thing, um, we're not just going to set uh, valves or turn off pressure enable um, intermittently and then when the when the overpressure switch registers that it's okay again then allow it to pressurize again we're going to actually switch it to to the semi-auto mode and put a main set point of zero and what that's going to do is go to zero and even after the the no pressure um, you know switch condition has been reset it's going to keep going down until the operator changes control mode back to auto or changes the main set point so this is this is basically like a latch. It, it, it's going to latch the, the corrective action and it's going to keep going to the bottom, okay? So um, that's a little bit different than, than the normal logic that we've seen. <clears throat> uh, the safety cable interlocks. When the safety cable is pulled, CPC not only interlocks pressurization and heating, but it will take corrective action to put the autoclave environment into a safe state for the trapped person. So not only is, is the heat disabled, but the autoclave will be forced into cooling. 
if the temperature is greater than 100. This includes actuating of the fan and putting it in semi-auto. And so pressurization will be disabled and pressure controller will be forced to zero set point and semi-auto, again, latching it to, to go all the way to the bottom. And both temperature and pressure controllers are switched to semi-auto so that corrective action commands will remain even after the switch is reset. So even if they pull, pull the safety cable and reset it, everything's still going to be going down to, the, to, to ambient conditions. Um, they will have to actually go in and change control modes in the manual screen to, to get that to stop. So, so here's the code. If safety cable is, is not okay, is off, disable heating, change the air controller to semi-auto, put a 70 degree set point, output of, of zero. Um, we're, we're then going to check RTC. If, if RTC is greater than 100, then I'm going to put the fan in semi-auto and turn it on, turn on cooling, and then again, put, put this at 70. This is kind of redundant. This, this line doesn't need to be there. It's already up here. Um, and then else, if the RTC is less than 90 and the fan happens to be on, then we're going to turn the fan off. So this keeps it from, from turning on and turning off at, at 100. So if above 100 turns on, then it'll be off. So, so we're saying if it's above 100, turn the fan on, start, start cooling. It's going to come all the way down to 90 before ever turning the fan off. Okay. And, uh, and definitely dump pressure down here. So that's, that's the important one. Um, emergency stop interlock, again, this is in the order that we're gonna see it in, in the general safety. So this is the very last thing we're gonna see in our general safety scripting. Um, when the e-stop is pushed, the general safety alarm will deactivate pressure, heating, cooling, fan, and vacuum pumps. Additionally, CPC will end the, the current run. So this is an important part that is usually missing from our logic. And it says, hey, if I hit e-stop, I want the run over, okay? Now, when training a customer, make sure they understand that that cure cycle will be stopped during a, an e-stop event. Some customers might not want that to happen and um, they might ask you not to put that in there. And ASC takes the position that it's okay not to end the run as long as all those other systems are stopped while the button is actually de um, pushed in. So, so you can, you know, this should be our standard, but again, talk to the customer about it. And most of them are gonna want the run to end with, if if someone e-stops it, so um, so anyway, uh, that's it. That's about 57 minutes, a long training session. Again, very important. Um, we go back to the very first slide. Safety is number one, and we have a lot of new uh, hardwire or a lot of new PLC code in there, and and some new and modified, you know, CPC code. So take a look at that at that uh, at that document um, that. That we that we talked about in in here the the new logic document and that'll give you all the all the details again um, and you can also use this PowerPoint presentation uh, which is linked to your training class as a you know take that copy it to your to your laptop and then you're going to have this available as you do your your work in the field okay so good luck and uh, as I say uh, be safe. <laughs>